Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Ruth Messenger, president of American Jewish World Service. Inspired by the Jewish commitment to justice, American Jewish World Service works to realize human rights and end poverty in the developing world. Ruth has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Ruth, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Mark. Delighted to be here. So talk about the work of American Jewish World Service. You're in a number of countries, and you really advance policies, um, activities across the world that tie back to a unique set of values. Okay, first of all, we're 30 years old this year. We're kind of proud of that. And I've been at AJWS for 16 years. And our mission, we think, is pretty clear. You articulated it. We are inspired by Jewish values, particularly by the commitment to pursue justice. And we work to realize human rights and end poverty for marginalized people in the developing world. We do that work in two ways. Neither one of them is unique, but they're unusual, and it's unusual for an organization to be doing both of these things. So we work internationally. Internationally, we find grassroots groups that are making social change. We do this work in 19 different countries, in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. In any country where we work, we attempt to both spread out and deepen our work so that in other words, we have large numbers of partner organizations. We try to give them opportunities to work with each other. What are those groups doing? Well, some of them are building civil society or rebuilding civil society after conflict. Think Sri Lanka, for example. Many of them are working on issues that we broadly define as sexual health and reproductive rights. But that little envelope includes the very ugly phenomenon of gender-based violence, rape as a weapon of war. It includes our HIV AIDS work, and it includes a very substantial portfolio of LGBT work because we are actually one of the largest U.S. funders of sexual minority rights work in the rest of the world. And then the third area, which we call natural resource rights and economic justice, that's a big title, but it's particularly about people's access to land to water and to food. So those are the thematic areas. The groups are just amazing. I mean, it's the skill of the AJWS staff is to find natural, very often indigenous leaders who have stepped forward, who have committed to make change, who have brought other people with them, who are fighting to hold on to their land, to force the government to give them title to their land. And it's the respect for the partner and the knowledge of the partner who is on the ground. It, it actually emerges from the idea that while you might have some expertise, the expertise that is on the ground is absolutely irreplaceable. Absolutely. In fact, the way, the way in which we talk about that, Mark, is there is a basic Jewish value called B'Tselem Elohim, which means simply that everyone is equally made in the image of the divine. And I take that and spin it a little bit to say that if you actually believe that, then you would stop thinking, as a great many Americans do, that all the solutions to the problems of the developing world are going to come out of Washington or Geneva or London or the United Nations because people know better what they need. And I have lots and lots of examples of that. And if you invest with them and support them in working on what they see as the next step or the next goal, you actually move things along further. Early on in my tenure at AJWS, I visited this village in Zimbabwe. Suffice it to say, it was a village of people who had been rounded up, set, thrown into this village, no services. They were coping. They had no help from their government. And I was walking around because we were going to be working there. And I saw a man teaching about 80 children under a tree. And I saw behind him an, a container port, like they put on the back of trucks. And I went over. That container port was obviously the classroom. It had a door cut in it and windows. And it had almost nothing inside, one or two desks, one or two books. So I waited until he had declared recess. And I um, went over and I introduced myself. And I made the mistake of saying, like, I've looked at your classroom. I've watched you teach. Um, you know, we're going to be working in this village. Is What do you most need? Uh, chairs and desks for the kids, a, a whiteboard, some books and pencils. And he actually looked at me as if so many people had had this discussion with him with that sort of top-down approach. And he said, Madam, 
I don't need any of those things. I just need for the children to have breakfast. You know, which was so obvious, but I hadn't included it in the list. And it was just like an example of ask first. So in terms of how you embed these, these approaches into an organization, how have you evolved the organization over the last 16 years of your leadership to create that space for that dialogue? And in your uh, people's um, inquiry, uh, into opportunities to collaborate. Um, how do they behave in ways that, that invite that type so of So a lot of what's happened in the last 16 years was, was growing the organization. So we're much larger now than when I took over. This basic notion of show respect for the groups on the ground, look for those groups that I guess I would define, Mark, as way below the radar, not the group that some large U.S. foundation might immediately find, not the um, United States Agency for International Development right. coming in and saying, well, we're going to do literacy in this part of East Africa, but actually looking for these groups. That was the strength of the staff at AJWS before I came, but we were tiny. So they would find a few groups in a few different countries. So what we've done is become much more articulate about that as an approach, put it into practice. The, the head of our international programs division, we've had two or three heads in my tenure, trains people to, to do that approach. And in every country where we work, we have at least one and sometimes more than one in-country consultant. Now, that's already different because most organizations right. that do international development put flocks of people on the ground and then hire flocks more. We don't do that. But we have a person or two who finds the best non-governmental community-based organizations and then engages in this dialogue with them. And between the finding and the actual funding, there are several months of back and forth that are about this. Do you fit our guidelines? Do we have new resources to help you? Because that requires raising money. But if the answer to those is yes, then what's the best thing for us to be funding you to do? How do we build in monitoring and evaluation? What's the right dollar amount for us to start you with? Because sometimes too much money is as bad right. as too little money. So that's, those are all elements of our international program work. How do you predict, what is your predictive approach that leads you to conclude that this investment is the, is the investment that you'll take? So I, I don't want to, I want to make it clear, I don't, think, I don't think we have that, I don't think we have that checklist. We're relying on the knowledge and the instinct of our grant making and program staff of the in-country consultants, and by the way, of the people that we're already helping on the ground, because they are the best predictors of who else in their neighborhood or community can contribute to these efforts. What we're looking for is people who not only know where they're going and what they want, but who are thinking about it from a rights-based approach. That doesn't mean that they need to stand up and read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to us, and they don't do that. Right. But it's, um, it's the farming group that says, you know, we've learned some new agricultural techniques, but there are outside mining interests coming and stealing our land or negotiating with our government to take our land out from under us. We believe we have a right to this land and we'd like you to help us organize to claim those rights. So that's another example of what we're looking for is this rights-based notion. And we are built in, particularly I would say in the last three years, an increasingly sophisticated system for strategic learning, research, and evaluation. Hopefully that will give us more predictive ability, but it's mostly geared to sort of say, let's be really clear with the people we're funding, what they think they can accomplish, how together we can measure it, do course corrections as necessary, and what's our hoped for goal, not just that what the group might do, that's pretty obvious, What's our hope for goal on their capacity to move the needle on this broad human rights issue? When you came, the organization was much smaller. Talk about what you encountered the, the day you walked through the door. Um, it was a very small organization that I think some very bright and insightful people had started in 1985. Um, I came in 1998. Most of those 13 years, I don't think there was huge interest in the American community and less interest probably in the American Jewish community in 
who's in Africa, how should we be working with them, why is it our obligation, what's going on right. in Central America. So there was kind of an emerging consciousness um, for various reasons. Sometimes disasters were beginning to be at least occasionally covered in our media so people actually could see what was going on. The quote, world is smaller, the, all yes. of the, the news, the computers, people actually saw some of what was happening. Um, but also think that probably it's about the point at which more Americans were sort of thinking about the rest of the world. So, although I promise you I wasn't responsible for it, in the first months after I came to AJWS, there was the, just nothing but one world disaster after another. Hurricane George, Hurricane Mitch, earthquake in El Salvador, ethnic cleansing in, uh, in Kosovo, earthquake in Turkey, those all happened in about the space of four years. And so we simply responded to those by saying, um, these are countries where we already work or where we could be working. We can help people right after disaster. But if you, if you ask us to do that, or as in you send us money to do that, we want you to know that we're going to be thinking about how do you move from disaster to development? Right. How do you take the opportunity of a, of a crisis on the ground to help people sort of rethink what the, who they are, what they want, how they want to proceed? So we basically kept doing that. And then we did it when the genocide began in Darfur and we organized people to protest in Washington because we you and I haven't talked yet about our Washington DC policy advocacy work, but we do that as well. Um, and then we got, so we got a lot of support around the issue of Darfur, so we just began growing. And the same thing happened after the South Asia tsunami in 2000 four or five. So effective service built into, a, into more support. And then you also included your, you would refer to your, your uh, policy work in Washington. Talk about how that evolved. Okay, so the first thing was as, as we got better known, as people got more interested in the rest of the world. And you had developed also in the process some uh, very important knowledge. Right, that and you we began share. identifying the countries where we really wanted to, to concentrate, although we, we did that again about just about four years ago now to make sure we weren't in too many countries. Mm -hmm. Um, but over time, we, we became sure of our capacity to pick good groups and to work with them. And by the way, to work with them over time because there are not that many other funders who are funding this right. kind of work at this kind of level. Um, at the same time, and in a particularly articulate way, first about 12 years ago where we started to just have a little presence in Washington, but then about four years ago when we sort of reaffirmed and clarified our mission, we said, okay, we're growing. We have over 500 grassroots groups in 19 countries that we're supporting. Hmm. We're gonna continue to do that. But the fact of the matter is if the US would change its policy in a couple of areas or reappropriate dollars in its budget or demand transparency about US aid, millions of people would be helped and right. not the hundreds of thousands that we reach. So we built a Washington office, a policy advocacy office, works with many other organizations in Washington, both faith-based and secular. But we've been a significant voice against the genocide in Darfur, on maximum transparency for aid to Haiti, on the issue of debt forgiveness to heavily impacted poor countries. Right now, so we, um, grab the attention of your viewers, we're working on two issues, one where we've been successful, I'll get to that in a minute, but the one we're working on most intently right now is to see if we can get the Congress of the United States to pass something called the International Violence Against Women Act, which would put our government on record as being hugely concerned about these endless stories of rape, assaults in the street. Some of the countries where we work, seven out of 10 women experience sexual assault sometime in their lives. So we're working intently on the Hill in Congress on that issue. On another issue I mentioned before that we're significant funders of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender groups in these countries where, to be clear, same-sex relationships are often punished by imprisonment and sometimes by death. By death, right. So the work we did in Uganda on the anti-homosexuality bill was protecting people's lives. So we have organized with some other groups in the last year, and the Secretary of State, John Kerry, has just appointed the first ever State Department Special Envoy concerned with LGBT issues. Related to the issue of violence against women, 
um, in, in South Asian countries. Of course, in our country, we're not immune uh, either, and, and lest we forget. Um, there is also the, uh, the issue of child marriage. Right. Uh, talk about your work in that So, area. first of all, on the general issue of gender-based violence and empowering women and girls, we're doing that work in almost every country. And we're sometimes doing it directly on issues of gender-based violence. Sometimes we're doing it on issues of land rights. Women are most of the farmers in the world. Right. But the child marriage issue is a, a separate issue, and it's an issue in which we have been the beneficiaries of a large grant from an individual anonymous donor to work on the issue of child marriage in India. So it's a good time to look at how we do our work because we now have several staff people on the ground in India. The first thing we did was get an Indian organization to help us do a study of root causes, to help us identify the four Indian states where we thought we could do the most work. And over the next year, we will end up with probably, I think this is about right, 40 different grassroots groups that are taking different approaches to this. Some may be trying to educate boys and men about why this is a bad practice for the, for the and women and are, girls in their community. This is being led by Indian women? Yes. This is being led by Indian right. communal leaders? Exactly. So we don't go in and say, oh, by the way, we think that the law in India, which says a girl shouldn't be married before the age of 18, should be enforced because we know from studies that 53% of Indian women are married before the age of 18. But we're not going in and saying that. We're going in and talking to people who know India well, to the staff that we had and the new staff we've hired and saying, in these four states where the numbers are particularly high, find us some groups that are organizing to change this. Find us some women who've gotten together and said, no way. We're not going to let our daughters do this. Find us some girls who are sort of fighting to be sure that they have full and equal rights, that they have agency over their own lives. So we'll end up, as I said, funding probably some 40 different grassroots groups and put in some baseline measures and some benchmarks and look to see what we can help them to do. But you're exactly right to make the point. They're already doing this work. And these issues will not be resolved overnight. How do you deal with <laughs> That's for the... Sure. How do you deal with the issue of sustaining the energy around an issue that could take a generation to, to, uh, to, to, to a, change? It's a good question. I think we and the groups, I think the groups we fund are all in it for the long haul. They, they know this is well, it's their slow home. work it's and their it's their society. home and it's, it's what their... they want to change. And our staff is pretty good at saying we'll be able to stay with you for a long time. We may look to bring in other funders. Actually, where we're going to, where we do run into a bit, a bit of a challenge is you can't tell donors, oh, we did it. You know, I have a donor who sent me some report, said, this is the report I like to get from the groups <laughs> I fund. And I looked at the report and I called him up and I said, that group is inoculating children against polio. You know, I get it. You can, you this can is how many number, arms right, we injected, right. this is how much serum we used, and this is the decrease in the incidence of polio. We're doing something much more complicated. We can't give you those kind of numbers. One of the things I think we're, I hope, that we're going to prove is that this business of listening to people, letting them determine the direction in which aid should be given, and recognizing how, much, how many ideas come from the bottom up, that's part of what we hope to prove is, a, is at least one good path towards social change. Um, how have you evolved, and based on this ability to engage others in investing in American Jewish World Service throughout these last 16 years? So I think you ask a, a good question because um, some of the investors that I have, and more of the investors I'm trying to get, tell me that they like social entrepreneurship. And when I push, they mean that they, in fact, would like to come up with the idea. They would like to make a grant that's also sort of an investment that reflects their entrepreneurial vision. And they're hoping, of course, they are hoping to do good. They're also hoping that somehow they get some return. And I try to say to these donors, I have 530 social entrepreneurs. They don't have your education. They don't live in this country. Some of them barely speak English. But they've stepped forward and said, I have a vision of how change could be made here. Very often, our groups are doing the work before they get any funding or any advice and guidance. So I'm looking for those risk-taking philanthropists who will understand the value of investing in people who have a vision for how to improve their own lives. And the return might be, the return on the investment might not be financial in nature. That's correct. Too often, 
people, and, and, and there, is, there is a place for uh, social entrepreneurship where there is a financial return on investment. But let's be clear that not every situation is going to also throw off capital. When I take people on a study tour to actually see the organizations, they become fierce converts to that point of view very quickly. They say things like, how much are we giving this organization? And it's amazing what they're able to do with the AJWS grant. And they write home, literally, or they write blogs for us. And it's like, this is what we saw as the result. And it's exactly what you're talking about. There is a tangible return on investments, just not dollars. Ruth Messenger, thank you so much. Thank I've you admired Mark. your work for so long. Thank you so much for thank sharing you. the work for Amer of American Jewish World Service. And thank you so much for your insight. Thank you.